system. So good evening, everyone. How is everybody today? Great. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. Wet. But you're here, and we're delighted to have you. My name is Joyce Strasser. I have the privilege of serving as dean of the Stillman School of Business. And tonight, it is my great pleasure and honor to kick off and welcome you to our 14th annual Pirates Pitch Startup Competition, which is brought to you by our Center of Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Now, those of you who are Stillman students certainly know, and probably all of our alums and advisory board members and judges would know as well, that one of our pillars of a Stillman education is this idea of transforming concepts into practice. So this showcase is a wonderful vehicle for having our students do exactly that. Take business concepts and make them a reality. And I know you're excited, as I am, to see the wonderful things that our students have developed. You know, we know that their engagement with entrepreneurial skills and mindset is going to be a talent that will take them to any outcome they wish. We know that these skills are transferable to all walks of life, personal, professional, what have you. So we love to see all of the engagement of our students with our Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Now in a couple of minutes, our student MCs are going to give a formal introduction to our judges, but I just want to extend my personal gratitude to each one of you for being here tonight, for looking over the plans that these students have presented, and for doing the tough work of asking questions and judging these offerings this evening. It's, we've got a lot, of, uh, a lot of faith in you, and we know that you'll provide good feedback and a wonderful outcome for our students. But I also want to thank the colleagues that we have in Stillman and beyond who helped this event. So for example, we had a lot of assistance from our university advancement team, our PR and marketing folks, and of course, our colleagues within Stillman who worked behind the scenes to pull together all the materials, make all the arrangements, and get everything set up so we can enjoy all these presentations. And absolutely, I have to thank, of course, last but not least, Susan Sherrick, Professor Susan Sherrick, the inaugural director of our Center of Innovation and Entrepreneurship. None of this would happen without Susan's tireless energy and passion for entrepreneurial pursuits. And I should tell you that next week at our Charter Day celebration, Susan is going to be recognized with a President's Award for Student Service for her dedication to ensuring that students have an excellent experience. So we're very proud of you, Susan. Congratulations on that. We look forward to celebrating. Now, before I uh, introduce the next set of speakers and take leave of the stage, I just want to point out that you do have a QR code here to access the program. And I know we've distributed hard copies as well, but that is available for your use. And I hope that you will take home with you either the virtual or the hard copy of this so you can remember our students and the fine work that they've done tonight. And I'm happy to tell you that we have tonight with us student MCs. So they'll be guiding you through this evening's program. And it's my pleasure now to introduce them. So first, we have Khalil Crooms, who's a freshman studying accounting and a member of the Entrepreneurship Club Executive Board. We also have Danielle Reed, who's a senior studying management and entrepreneurship. We have Torrance Liddell, who's a sophomore studying visual and sound media and is also a member of the Bushino Leadership Institute. We have later arriving Matthew Padiati, who's a senior studying finance and marketing and also a member of the executive board of the Entrepreneurship Club. And finally, Shane Luxick, is a senior majoring in finance and IT management and also a member of the Entrepreneurship Club Executive Board. So these talented students will take us through bit by bit the program and we're grateful to have them involved. And I will introduce the first person, so Khalil Crooms is gonna kick us off. So please everybody, thank you for being here tonight and let's welcome Khalil. Good evening, 
and welcome to Shark Tank, seeing hostile. Tonight, your audience, you, our audience, are going to participate in the entrepreneurial journey of select group of CN Hall students as they pursue the dream that many of us students have, to start a business. You will hear and see some of the best startup ideas from our undergraduate and our graduate students here at CN Hall, student, CN Hall Stillman School of Business. The stakes are high. Six finalist teams are seeking $16,000 in startup funding prizes to be awarded by the group of distinguished judges that we have here today all successful entrepreneurs, might I add. We will introduce them shortly. They are eagerly waiting to hear what the students have to say. The road to the startup finals began in January when students throughout the university were invited to a series of skill workshops to help them prepare for the qualifying rounds. A total of 15 student teams took the next step in submitting executive summaries of their startup concepts. With assistance from alumni, entrepreneurs and Center of Innovation and Entrepreneurship narrowed the fields to the top six entrepreneurs that you will meet tonight. Over the past month, these student entrepreneurs have met with faculty and alumni, mentors to assist them. Also, submitted their business plans to the judges in advance of this evening event. I'd like to recognize our sponsor, the law firm Outside General Counsel Solutions. Big thanks to attorneys Chris and Tony Davis and their staff for providing legal assistance to our Pirate Pitch finalists. Now, I would like to ask Danielle Reed to come up to the podium and introduce our judges. If you would give a round of applause. Welcome everyone. I'm honored to be here this evening to introduce our prestigious panel of judges. Brian Jakovich graduated from the Stillman School of Business in 2009 and is the founder, CEO, and owner of Fusion Health, the largest healthcare software company for departments of corrections in the United States, where their software manages the patient care of over 300,000 each day. Headquartered in Woodbridge, New Jersey, Fusion employs more than 100 people throughout the country. Brian won an Ernst and Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award for New Jersey in 2020. Fusion Health has been listed on the Inc. 5000 as one of the fastest growing private companies in the country and the eighth fastest growing private business in New Jersey by NJ Biz. Brian started one of his first businesses at Seton Hall when he was president of the Entrepreneurship Club. Today, Brian is a chair of the Center of Innovation and Entrepreneurs Advisory Board and was inducted into the university's Entrepreneur Hall in 2021. Welcome, Brian. <laughs> Shannon Morris earned both a BA in Communications and Public Relations and an MA in Marketing and Corporate Communications from Seton Hall University. While an undergraduate at the, at the hall, she was captain of the swim team and a two-time Big East academic All-American. After graduating, she spent several years in corporate marketing at leading orga organizations such as Fuji Electric Corp of America, Prudential, and Home Box Office before making the leap to entrepreneurship. She is a founder and managing partner of Tank Collective, and an advertising agency and founder of The Whistle Company, a marketing accelerator that helps brands to scale. Shannon was formerly CEO of the Sigma Group, an advertising agency. In 2013, Shannon was inducted into the Seton Hall University Entrepreneur Hall of Fame. Let's welcome Shannon. <laughs> Gabino Roche and his twin brother, Stefan, founded Sapphire, an innovative and disruptive fintech venture in 2017. Sapphire's key to success is its patent-approved AI technology that digitizes and speeds the pre-trading space while providing trading and post-trade benefits for financial institutions at the same time. The company, which holds 105 patents, has dramatically increased the efficiency 
of back office operations that formerly were accomplished with faxes, emails, phone calls, and spreadsheets. Clients and investors include JP Morgan and BlackRock. Gabino is a first-generation American who credits much of his entrepreneurial passion and drive to growing up in an entrepreneurial family of Cuban immigrants. Gabino studied business technology at Seton Hall and is a member of the Center of Innovation and Entrepreneurship's Board of Advisors. Gabino was inducted into the Seton Hall Hall of Fame in 2023. Welcome, Gabino. Karina Castagna is a first-generation college graduate and two-time alumna of Seton Hall, earning high honors within her BA and MPA degree. The unique composition of interdisciplinary studies, including communications, Catholic studies, and business from her undergraduate degree, and a concentration in nonprofit management from her graduate degree also allows her to criti critically think, apply, and act in numerous scenarios. During her time as a student, she represented Seton Hall for the annual CFA Research Challenge. Her team played in the Final Four. She also served as the VP of Membership for Women in Business and continues the, to serve the SHU community as a council member of the Young Alumni Council. Post-graduation, Karina started a business, Pesto Joe LLC, in memory of her father who unexpectedly passed during her time as a graduate student. In June 2022, Karina joined the Pirate Launchpad Accelerator Program, where she was awarded SEEK funding and has continued to grow and expand Pesto Joe. Karina is a member of the Young Alumni Council and a frequent guest lecturer in entrepreneurship classes. Welcome, Karina. Now, judges, you have a tough job ahead of you this evening. Now, I would, I would like to ask Torrance Little to come to the podium to provide a rundown of this evening's format and procedures. Thank you, Danielle. All right, good evening, everyone. So, each finalist team will have seven minutes to make a pitch presentation, and then the judges will have five minutes to ask questions. The first place prize is $8,000, second place prize is $4,000 and $4,500, $4, and third place prize is $3,000. The, the judges will be looking for creative and innovative thinking about new markets, products, and services. Another important thing to note is that the teams will be judged on their perceived ability to execute their concepts and turn them into sustainable businesses. The funding prizes awarded are from CIE's Venture Fund Endowment. Each finalist team is also entitled to receive legal services from our legal sponsor. A big thank you to OGC, which is Outside General Solutions, and Chris Santomassimo and Anthony Davis and their team for generous legal sponsorship. So after all the presentations are completed, the judges will leave the stage to deliberate, and then we'll be holding the Audience Choice Award. Only the audience members will be able to, uh, who are in the auditorium, can participate in this uh, Choice Award. And after that, we'll announce the winner of the $500 Audience Choice Award at the end of the competition, along with the other winners. All finalists and judges should note that when you have one minute remaining in either a pitch presentation or during the Q&A sessions, uh, the student MCs, such as me, Danielle, and Khalil, will hold up a sign indicating that you have one more minute left. Now, I would like to ask Khalil to come up to the podium to introduce our first contestant. Please join me in welcoming our finalist team, Maria, Bryce, Miller, Vaughn, Jackson Vaughn, Morgan Fry, Nolly Rose, and their startup, Nature Phil. Team, anytime you are ready, you can begin your pitch.
You have seven minutes for your presentation. Good luck. Test, test. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jack Vaughn, and I'm the CFO. Good evening. I'm Bryce Miller, and I'm the COO. Good evening. I'm Nalani Rios, and I'm the CMO. Hello. My name is Morgan Fry, and I'm the CCO. Hi. I'm Maria Saida. I'm CEO. And tonight, we would like to introduce to you Naturefill. But first, um, I'm sure all of you are having a great start to the evening. Um, but raise your hand, because I know you're all going to go take a shower after this, right? So raise your hand if you use shampoo, conditioner, or body wash. I think everyone's hand's going to be raised. Now keep your hand raised if those products you use are green. Look around. It's a small number, right? Well, that's because only 6.4% of all beauty and personal care products are clean and green. Tonight, as I said, we would like to introduce to you Nature Fill Replenish, a groundbreaking subscription-based dispensary company poised to, um, excuse me, poised to revolutionize the way consumers access clean body care products. So, what is the problem, you might ask? Well, 93.6% of all personal care products are not green, and they contain harsh chemicals like sulfates and parabens. Another issue is that we as consumers and producers use too much plastic. The beauty and personal care industry alone is responsible for the production of 120 million units of rigid plastic every year, and only 9% of this actually gets recycled. So, um, our mission is to help consumers and producers go green once and for all, and also put an end to the climate crisis. So, how are we going to do this? Unlike existing refill programs that often perpetuate the cycle of waste by um, giving refills and more additional plastic bottles, we, Naturefill stands out by providing consumers with refillable pro bottles that can be brought to our innovative kiosks. These kiosks would be located in major retailers and dispense soaps by the ounce. This will allow our customers to replenish clean shampoos, conditioners, and soaps, all while significantly reducing their waste, and as well as saving money. So, excuse me. Um, so, we would be partnering with popular renowned body care brands such as um, Dove and Suave, but here's the catch. In order to be featured in one of our kiosks, you need to produce a very clean organic product. Um, and so once you, the producer produces a clean organic product, they would be placed in our kiosk. And then to start up, we would have, um, be partnering with clean brands such as Dr. Bronner's and Native to garner consumer interest and producer attention. Therefore, these big names like Dove and Suave will be interested, uh, interested in us and want to enter the newly disrupted green body care market. Um, um, oh, yes. And a mobile app will also be developed for consumers to track real-time um, cost reductions as well as waste reductions. And this app will also give them, oh my God, give them redeemable points that can be used as incentive to buy products from us. Thank you, Maria. Now we're going to take a look into our market insights. So according to Fortune Business Insights, the global liquid soap market is actually expected to grow from $22 billion to almost $36 billion by 2030. This is most likely due to the fact that 60% of consumers say that they'd pay more for a product with sustainable packaging, and 78% of U.S. consumers say that a sustainable lifestyle, ma st oops, excuse me, a lifestyle matters to them. This leads us to who we would be advertising to. Of course, we'd like to encompass everyone, but we'd most likely be advertising to people that already implement environmental-friendly devices in their everyday lives. So people that like to go in touch with nature, people that do physical activity outside, and we would also be marketing and advertising our product in these retail outlets such as Target and Whole Foods, so we'd be bringing our product to the consumers. Uh, we would market our product basically as something that is limiting waste, protecting the environment, is convenient for the consumer, and it also has a good location in store. Thank you, Bryce. So now we're going to talk a little bit about how Naturefill differs from the competition. So firstly, we would be operating within an undersaturated market, meaning that Naturefill Replenish would be able to have first mover advantages as a new entrant. Additionally, we will have exclusive brand partnerships that would not be able to be duplicated. So brands that we would partner with, such as Dove and Olay, would be exclusive and unique to Naturefill. 
Additionally, we will have greater convenience in refill stores because consumers will not have to go out of their way to purchase products that they would already be buying. Nature for Replenish would be operating in major retailers such as Target and Whole Foods, so again, consumers will not have to go out of their way. Additionally, along the same vein of convenience, Nature for Replenish kiosks offer multiple uh, pro personal care products within the, within the kiosk, so consumers will not have to waste time shopping around the store. Instead, they would be able to buy all of their personal care products within the one kiosk. Additionally, current non-green products on the market contain harmful chemicals, both for humans as well as for the environment. And lastly, green products that are currently on the market do not offer sustainable packaging solutions, unlike Naturefill Replenish. Thanks, Lonnie. Now, in the interest of time, I obviously won't have the time to cover every aspect of Naturefill's financials. However, I do want to spend this time to cover three main things. Mainly, the main streams of revenue of the company, the underlying assumptions of those revenue streams, and a P&O statement of three years. Now, as most of you know, revenue is made up of price and quantity, so I've taken the liberty of listing a stagnant price and some of the features that contribute to quantity underneath some of our revenue streams here. Now, before we conclude with the presentation, though, I did want to touch on um, some of the core elements of our business model. First, um, bottles and soap are inherently tied together. After all, what good is our soap with nothing to dispense it into? What good are our bottles with nothing in them? So what we expect is that most customers will be making a bundle purchase when they come into the Target stores, and that's why we have the bottles priced so low at $5, to entice those consumers to buy uh, that bottle, stick their foot in the door, and ultimately commit to that bundle purchase. Secondly, it's important to note that our machines will deplete at an increasing rate because you have both new and pre-existing bottles being filled. Um, assuming that new customers will deplete the machine one time a month. We can expect new customers to account for 19, 20 ounces and 120 bottles on a per month basis. While this is the total quantity in the first month, we can expect that total quantity to increase in months to come. Um, to increase in months to come. Wrap it up. All right, well, I would love to address some of the financials in the uh, Q&A session to follow, but that wraps up our time for now. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you. This will be your time to ask questions. Hello. So great job, guys. Um, I think we generally just do a, like a question at a time. I guess my first, the main question would be, what would stop a brand like? Um, Neutrogena from doing a kiosk on their own. What makes you guys have an edge over a company like Neutrogena or one of the other brands that you mentioned going out and building a kiosk of their own? So what makes us different is that yes, Neutrogena can go and make their own kiosk, but it's only gonna be that one brand. So what we do that they wouldn't be able to do is we're having multiple brands in one location in one kiosk. So say you use Olay, but someone else uses Dove, both of them can come to our kiosk, but for Neutrogena, for example, if you don't use Neutrogena, you're not gonna go there. So that's what makes us different, is we have multiple brands in the same kiosk, in the same location, so that multiple people who use different products can go to the same place. Um, I'll go next real quick, uh, by the way, uh, when people invest in companies, Maria, your confidence in the presentation, they, they invest in the founder or the leader of the company. That was a really good presentation at the top. The rest of the team did the terrific job too, but I'm just telling you, as a CEO, that's the way you want to present. Um, in terms of, so to me, uh, a little bit of a skeptic because the idea is great, but I want you to think of the selfish interest of these big companies you're talking about, right? So you talked about some of the carcinogens and things in, inside soaps that are not good, but those, some of those partners actually have some of those chemicals in them. So you wanna probably, even though you have a multi-partner kiosk, you will probably want to partner with one or two first because the sales pitch to that one or two partners is gonna be very difficult and they're gonna want some exclusives in the beginning if they're gonna do it with you, okay? So pick one and pick a product. And the reason why I'm talking about that is your movement is a social movement, right? It's a cause, that is your brand. 
And so if you start a trend where you have clients committed to it, it becomes harder for a new to Gina or someone else to take it on. So I'm curious if you've thought about the adoption strategy, right? Because it's a, a grassroots uh, business model. You got to, in order to convince a partner to come on with you. So that's one. Two, you, I, I didn't see anything around the logistics for the company partners. All the expenses that you have in here are assuming that your partners are going to incur that cost. So the margins are very small already in this retail business. It, it might be interesting to hear what you thought about in terms of, if, let's say you got Neutrogena or Avino to agree to come on. What's the social strategy, right? Because you can actually eliminate all the advertising and just make this a guerrilla social marketing campaign in cer certain locales. That piece with the logistics, because not only are you asking them to do a kiosk with, with you and share it with others, what, how are you going to save them that cost so they, they actually get a, a tied in revenue stream? Those are my two questions, if it makes sense. Um, so we kind of had to cut out a lot of our presentation due to the, the lack of time, but one thing that we talked about with social strategy is that there is also something to be said about being first to the market. And have you ever seen one of those Coca-Cola machines? And before that, there were machines that had, you know, separate machine, like separate bottles where you could put different sodas. But one thing is something to be said about a machine that encompasses all those products. And while we would be first to the market, we would also be covering the, the cost of bottles. We would be pr providing our own bottle for the company and for, for the consumers. And we would also be using our money and using our funding in towards making the machines themselves so the, co the companies wouldn't have to do anything but sell us their, I'm sorry, excuse me, sell us their product and sell us their liquid soap detergent by the ounce rather than by the bottle. And I didn't quite understand the financial question. Are you asking why would companies want to cover all the costs for producing the soap and pay us money for ad revenue? Yeah, because the margins are small, right? So then even if you give them the bottles, it's kind of a big cost for you. I don't want to take all the time. So there's a missing piece here around the logistics, the, the, the bottle production, the margins they're going to make on it. You got to guarantee them the social strategy so that they're willing to invest. And I don't think it's three years. I think it's going to be at least five. I think actually in the live plan system, it only let me go as far as three years, so that's why three are only shown there, but the goal would have been to get five years and for the financial projection. Thank you. So I would totally agree that it's a problem, but to cut out a little bit of my comments, happy to talk to you afterwards, is out of the interest of kind of the social movement here, are you thinking of giving any bulk pricing for customers that are repeat customers, giving them any kind of discounts if they were to fill multiple jars of multiple products, or if... Um, they're, again, repeat customers if they'd get coupons to encourage them to come back. I think that's actually a really good idea. Um, for the purposes of the financial model here, I wanted it to be uh, pretty simple to explain. So it is just linear. You have the 19, 20 ounces stacked onto one another each month. And for the purposes of, of that, I wanted to make it simple. However, we were actually thinking about a subscription model in the near future since one of the main premises of our brand is reoccurring revenue, people coming back on a per month basis to refill their soap. So I think that's a really good idea and something we should consider. Wonderful presentation, guys. Now for our second finalist, Nathaniel Bikeman is a junior majoring in accounting who is a co-founder of Attendee VPN. Nathaniel, anytime you're ready, you may start. Good evening. My name is Nathaniel Bickman. I'm a sophomore here at Seton Hall University and the CEO of Attendee VPN. 
I'm studying fintech and accounting, and thank you very much for the opportunity to be able to present my business. Attendee VPN sells dedicated IP VPNs hosted on dedicated physical servers operating on a decentralized network. A VPN or a virtual private network allows you to safely and securely browse the internet without having to fear hackers stealing your data or any malicious parties having access to it. A VPN works by changing your IP address and relocating you to a different position. Now, this eventually will stop anybody from knowing who you are, where you are, and what device that you are using. In addition to this relocation, a VPN encrypts your data, sends it to a secure tunnel to an exterior server with a different IP address before sending that information and data up to the internet. Now, a VPN has many uses, including avoiding price discrimination, gaming all over the world, and even accessing geo-restricted content. Now, many VPNs operate under a shared infrastructure. What that means is that many big companies, like Nord, and many small companies like ProtonVPN, who are our competitors, essentially take hundreds of their users and compile them onto a small amount of shared IP addresses and a shared server. This leaves extremely massive security vulnerabilities, as well as having an unreliable server system, and many more problems to come, including privacy concerns. Now, in addition to all of this, these companies undermine the exact reason that you use a VPN as they take all of your data, collect it, log it, store it, and then sell it. Essentially, you, as you're paying for their product, you're not actually using their VPN. Now, our solution is to simply create a cost-effective, dedicated infrastructure. As I said, we sell dedicated IP VPNs hosted on dedicated physical self-wiping servers and the benefits of having such a dedicated IP include enhanced security, more remote access, easier authentication, and most importantly, control over your own IP and internet reputation. You are paying for exactly what you will be doing on the internet and not what somebody else will be doing. A lot of shared VPN companies, as they offer all of these shared IPs to all their users, get flagged for malicious use. This leaves you paying for a service that doesn't actually work. With a dedicated IP, you completely circumvent this and you are in control of your own actions. Now, as an addition to this, we host our VPNs on dedicated servers as this allows our users to have extremely quick connection speeds as well as very reliable connections. This may seem like an extremely premium product, however, our pricing is extremely competitive. Our competition revolves around two companies, Nord and Cape Technologies, which both together hold over 50% of the market share. Now, we also have three categories of VPNs up there, which are the competition products. The first one are free VPNs, the second are shared VPNs, and the third are dedicated IP VPNs. Free VPNs are mainly used to simply bypass very localized internet restrictions. This is mainly used by high school students and schools who want to get on a certain website that the school restricts. Now, this may seem like a great solution, however, it's not. A lot of free VPNs simply take all of your data, sell it, and leave you to dry. Now, in addition to this, free VPNs also have a very slow connection speed, and that's, if any at all, you can actually connect to them when you want to. Shared VPNs are more functional, however, the problem is they have many security vulnerabilities, privacy concerns, and unreliable connection, and very dirty IPs, as I mentioned before. Lastly, the closest thing to us are dedicated VPNs. Dedicated VPNs are only mainly sold by bigger companies like Nord, and the problem with them is, they are a worse quality of product compared to us and also more expensive. Nord prices their product at around $24 a month. Now, this $24 does not include a hosting on a dedicated server, as well as they still take your data and sell it as mentioned in their privacy policy. We, on the other hand, charge $8 a month for, for you to have a dedicated IP VPN. Next, we host you on a dedicated server, allowing multiple benefits. And lastly, we don't take your data, nor do we even collect it as we're neither an auto renewal company, nor do we care about any of your information. Our target market is students aged 15 to 20, 16 to 25 years old. This is because they are more well-versed in technology, have used VPNs before, and this is about 5 million students in America and 25% of the US student population. Our second target market are senior-ish citizens from 40 to 65 year old 
who are, in a sense, more uh, financially viable to be able to afford this product, and they have a lot more assets to protect, the working individuals. This is about 25 million individuals as we're narrowing this market group to people who still are more adept at technology as it's much easier to convert them. Our team in key roles consists of myself as the CEO, Alexander Wood, who is the CFO, he's studying at Brown University and is majoring in mathematics and economics, and our advisors, who are Alexander Zilberman, who's a software developer, an engineer, and Carl Bickman, a practicing attorney. Now, our financial productions are extremely conservative following a linear growth rate that involves backing with our customer acquisition and retention. Now, the reason for this is we do not want to greatly extrapolate anything. If we were to, our numbers would probably multiply it and be doubled, as currently in 2024, our profits are 6,000. That is more on track to be around 12,000. However, we are using a lower growth rate for a more conservative estimate. Our progress to date is a 165% funded Kickstarter, which was a good proof of concept with 73 backers. We are currently live on our website, selling to over 80 clients, and we are currently profitable. Now, we are looking for a way to reduce our, uh, increase our margins by reducing our transaction costs and also offering various forms of payment, including crypto. Our pricing and sales is about $8 a month, and the longer subscription is a greater of a discount, which will be $88 a year. Now, we are looking for a more automated workflow, which we will eventually get in one of the things that we will ask funding for, and we receive all orders through the website. For our marketing activities, we mainly market through social media and advertisement, and we are looking to expand into sponsorships. And lastly, for the funding use, 2,000 go towards sponsorships, 1,500 towards marketing and advertisement, 1,500 towards website development, 2,000 towards an external audit, and 1,000 towards external security testing. In conclusion, Attendee VPN will offer a more advanced, above average quality VPN for a below average price in a rapidly grow growing market. So just to confirm, the product is out in the wild. It's a live product. You can download it. People are using it. Yeah, so we currently have already 80 customers who are currently using it and growing every day. Um, they pay $8 a month at a minimum, unless they have a larger subscription. Uh, it is, you can install it on any device. You can use it on unlimited devices that you want. And it's dedicated solely to you. And what's your strategy for uh, like dedicated IP acquisition, given the fact that there are only so many uh, like IP addresses out there? So as you grow, you're going to need more dedicated IPs since you're, you're trying to apply this model now? Yeah, we're going to keep us as dedicated IPs. They aren't expensive or anything. It's simply just that the larger companies are monopolies and are extremely greedy and do not want to provide the service as it isn't as profitable. My cost is $6 a month per consumer, meaning I get around a $2 profit without factoring in transaction costs. And we're looking to continue to keep this going for as long as possible. All right, thank you. Thank you. Great presentation. I guess my main question, so this is a direct-to-consumer model, right? So it's, gonna, I'm not a technology person, but you did a great job explaining everything. But I understand it as a direct-to-consumer, you want you want to go directly to a consumer and get them to sign up on your website. I think um, I want to know a little bit more about your marketing strategy to that secondary audience of 40 to 65, the senior citizen-ish people. <laughs> And um, just to know a little bit more about how you're going to educate them on the fact that they need a VPN. I think about it like my dad, he uses his computer, but he uses the very basic, you know, but he needs a VPN. Tell, tell me why and how are you going to get him to convince uh, him to know that he needs a VPN? So on top of uh, the uh, C to B that we, uh, C to C, uh, B to C that we do, um, we are mainly that for now. We also offer consulting service and service rentals. On our website, you can see exactly why an FAQ have completely has to use the VPN. Another thing is a lot of the people that we convert are people that already come to me uh, for the consulting services that we offer as well. They get hacked. If nothing is stolen, the police actually cannot do anything. I am more of a freelancer for this. I don't want to charge people for this, and I still do it. Um, and that way, so we have a more social media and growing presence to establish trust, which of course takes time, the two biggest problems. And of course, we want to expand into sponsorships with YouTubers that I have already gotten in touch to. And lastly, we currently have two contracts with two businesses that are hopefully in the works and one that will be signed very soon 
uh, for VPNs, dedicated IP VPNs. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. And I appreciate the background because I myself am not that techie of a person either, um, but you did a great job explaining it, so thank you. My question is specifically over your self-wiping system because it seems as if this is kind of your specific niche as to how you're posing yourself against your competition. I am interested as to how that works, if that's more expensive, and if, even if that's patentable for you. Yeah, so the dedicated IP VPNs all on the backside, it's not necessarily that it's more expensive as we don't need to buy any licensing or anything. It's more expensive simply because of the product that we're providing. It's much cheaper, for example, for me to provide a sh couple shared IP addresses to a thousand customers on one server as that brings my cost down to about a dollar fifty cents a customer. However, because we're in this niche market of dedicated IP VPNs hosted on a dedicated server with our patented kind of self-wiping mechanic, it allows us to keep our customers anonymous, make sure that no logs and data is stored and sold, and lastly, simply, it's more expensive because I have to provide this server and IP address per customer. Okay, uh, I, I, I have two questions. One on the marketing, just like uh, Shannon, which is great presentation. I'd invest. But what I will tell you is uh, phone, uh, fear. Fear factor probably is a big thing that you could do. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, uh, the 40 to 65 will definitely purchase. The mere fact that they, go, uh, they get hacked, that point that you just made that if nothing was stolen, the police can't do anything, you can make a 15 second clip of that and it would go viral and people would take a look at this. That's one. And then the second piece is scale. Um, the whole IP thing that Brian was asking you about is my concern too. How do you get, how do you make this an even bigger profit margin for yourself if you're not using Microsoft Azure to try to help with some of the equipment or Snowflake? Talk about that a little bit. So we use extremely specialized, I'll start with the second question. We use extremely specialized providers with a very big reputation that we have behind us. We're currently Alexander Zilbermere, software developer and engineer. We're currently working to onboard him to the company for a certain equity of the company, which will allow us access to many more, uh, you know, providers and et cetera, giving us a lower cost. Uh, yeah, thank you. Please join me in welcoming seniors Annabelle Rackety and Joseph Barwood and their business, Mayor Jen. Good luck, Andy and Joe, and please start your pitch when you are ready. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Annabelle Rockety. And my name is Joseph Brood. Today, we're going to be presenting Mirror Jam. So to start, I wanted to go over a little bit of history, but stay with me, okay? It's not going to be too bad. But we're going to go all the way back to a time when record sound didn't even exist. But thankfully to Thomas Edison, 1878, he created the phonograph and revolutionized the way that we integrate with sound. But before that, there was a the purest instrument of all, and that instrument is the human voice. The human voice, with all its complexities and intricacies and boundless capacity, has changed the way that we really listen to everything. And we've brought generations together and brought different cultures together, all based on singing and different musicalities. Another thing that's around us all day, every day, is sound. Everywhere we go, we're hearing either our favorite melodies in our AirPods or walking by the green and hearing a bunch of people singing. There's a many, million different things that we're hearing every single day, but there's one more thing you're hearing every day, and stay with me, okay? This one's AI. No matter where you go, you're hearing every single person talk about it, whether it's you're going to lose your job to AI or you have to use this new app, 
there's a million things, but we believe that we can bring together sound, the phonograph, AI, and all of these things to create Mirror Jam, an AI-driven singing technology that will change the way that you learn to sing. So even though we have a great idea, what we really need is a great team. Uh, and I'm leading it, I'm the CEO. I've sang for you know, almost all of my life, and I've really enjoyed it. Uh, but of course, with that are some problems. I'm joined with Annie Rockety. Um, I'm Annie Rockety. I have a passion for operations, and I've worked in financial operations as well as supply chain operations for years. And they have a large network of educators that could see this being very helpful in their fields. We're also sadly not joined by Owen today, but he is our project manager, our CTO, and he knows everything about creating an app because he has already made one profitable today. So together, we're coming to tackle some common problems. First, it's very challenging to learn music. Second, it's very expensive. And third, it's very hard to be a part of the music business or the music field if you're somebody who's maybe more unique or specifically, in my case, a man. I know I definitely struggled with some adversity when I was trying to get into singing because people would judge me for being a male in a more female predominant um, area. So we're going to do that in two main ways. We've got tailored feedback. That means that singers are going to be able to use their voice upload it to our app, our app's gonna be able to understand it using natural language processing, and then use deep fake technology to sing back to the user what they should be singing. It adds a very easy way to have unique and tailored feedback. Going into that, it's also qualitative feedback, but quantitative. So having an AI provide feedback, especially in a field such as singing, is very challenging. So what we're gonna have them do is, of course, upload the music so that the AI can understand what they're trying to use as a reference. This allows people to tailor their feedback specifically to them and get good feedback. But we're not gonna stop at just feedback. We really wanna help the students that are struggling all around the USA and to help every teacher become a music teacher. As you can see with the stat right here, high schoolers that had music courses, did better in their other core courses compared to their peers, which is very interesting and also a little ironic because usually music and the arts are the first thing to go. But we want to create an alternative to that, to allow students to receive a music education and do better in their core classes as well as find a sense of self, find a sense of community with the music. And we believe Mere Jam can do that. Now I'm going to take us into our SWOT analysis. Some of our strengths is that this is a really big market. Of course, students and you know, music as a whole, very big. Um, that being said, it's already very developed. There's a lot of resources out there, especially when you factor in the educational aspect. And it's going to take some time to develop our app. That kind of follows us into our threats as well. It's going to take a lot of time, going to take a lot of money. And there are already a lot of fears surrounding AI. But we have some techniques to combat that. Granted, we think our opportunities far outweigh that. This is a large growing market, especially considering COVID and people are in need of educational support. We think that combating this with music is the way to do it. And we definitely think our deep fake technology gives us that edge to set us apart from the competition. So I'm sure you guys have heard of a couple of these educational suites, whether that's on your own computer or on a television ad, they're all around. They teach millions of different subjects and they all use different algorithms, but what they don't have is personalized, tailored feedback that we will have with Mere Jam. Every student learns differently, but a lot of these teach in the exact same way. I'm a hands-on learner. Joseph isn't a hands-on learner, but that's okay because Mere Jam will allow you to learn the way you want to learn and sing the way you want to sing. Now I'm going to go into our business model a little bit. Of course, I mentioned our target audience, which is that low to mid-income level people, students, schools, almost anyone who has the propensity to learn and the desire to grow musically. We're going to have our you know, key activities that I talked about. They're going to sing into Mere Jam. Mere Jam's going to sing back to them with some feedback. And then, of course, since we're trying to create that all-inclusive environment, we're going to congratulate them for their hard work. Finally, we're doing a market plan with all sorts of things, you know, Instagram, Facebook, but specifically we want to reach out to schools and community choirs to make sure that everyone's invested. This is a great opportunity for schools to get in so that they can spend only a little bit of money to teach a lot of people some music. Finally, I'm going to talk about our pricing. We have multiple tiers of a subscription model. We're going to try to offer discounts to schools and you know, low-income communities. We're going to have a low barrier of entry. And then, of course, that free subscription for the beginning so that you can get accustomed to using an AI because it may be a barrier. And then finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about our pro forma. In the first year, we're going to have a big app development cost, and also our user base is going to be far smaller. So we're going to be operating at a net loss. 
However, by year three, we think we're going to be profitable, even if just a little bit. We definitely recognize that our API costs and our AI costs are going to go up with our user bases because, you know, each one costs money, but we still see ourselves making profit. And then by year five, we see ourselves making almost $400,000 because this is going to be you know, pretty big. We think that if we can catch in a lot of the educational you know, experience, we think it'll be a great success. Thank you. Wonderful presentation, thank you. I myself um, actually was inquired way back in high school, and so that's fun to see this come up, and I think even though I'm out of the you know high school age group and everything, this is definitely a way for a creative and a musical individual to kind of boost their own skills instead of just belting out in the shower. And um, so my question is because you had hit on focusing on low income communities and even bolstering up choirs amongst the schools. And so I'm wondering if how this will work, um, a couple questions in one. So feel free to touch on these in the order that you feel best fits. So I'm wondering if choirs are able to upload their specific songs, even if there is a school musical, if they're able to kind of, the musical director is able to aid a specific song onto that app and then give it out to all of their students so that they can practice on their own time. Um, and because of that, I'm wondering what does the licensing look like on your end to then process those songs on AI and if any cost would be um, taken on your end for that? Sure, great question. Um, I think definitely something that we're going to be working on in, is uh, having the user be able to upload anything. So, you know, any sort of upload would, you know, fit their needs. So, as you know, like, there's different voice parts. So, if there's, a, you know, a tenor might have to upload a certain thing that they're training to, whereas, like, an alto may have something completely different. Um, but I agree with you. The licensing is going to be something that we're going to have to work on. It might require and likely will require partnering with somebody who already has a licensing agreement, such as a Spotify or an Apple Music or something like that. Um, but that's definitely going to be a big cost that we're going to have to, you know, figure out what we're going to do with it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious, curious uh, have you tested um, some of the models just to see yourselves on the AI? Um, that, that would be good. I like the idea. And then the second question I have for you is, is um, uh, if you took investment dollars, because your, your CTO, you, he, he, it has to be on shore. The, the development costs are too cheap. It's not going to be that price. I can tell you right now because I do tech. Yeah, I was going to say that's, <laughs> that's way too cheap. Yeah, yeah there's, uh, so I'm just saying your expectation there. You need a, someone who's going to do this for equity for you guys, right, As a, that's an engineer. So let's assume that you got that handled. The, the, the question I have for you after that, though, is um, the investment dollars to get into that, how do you, uh, you're going to have to do something else in tandem with this so that you get ubiquity, meaning as many people as possible using it, so that you have a community to draw investors to stay with you a little, little bit in the long run. So let me know what you thought about that as well as your testing model of this tech. Okay, yeah. So we use, are using TensorFlow to, TensorFlow and Python to understand and interpret the singing and the different recordings and it does work well and I have seen it work with the deep fake and it does come back well. Um, I haven't placed it in a model like a huge language model yet but I've done it like short form and we have tested it like and it has worked well. We are looking for it to be a larger language eventually. Um, did you want to take a question? Sure. Um, and I definitely agree with you like to get a sound backing from investors we're going to have to have a large audience growth especially like um, you know with the amount of investments that come forward. So I think what we would probably do is create advertising campaigns a little bit beforehand and probably try to develop a social media growth about music and about seeing performance and maybe even get some schools on board preemptively. Um, and then I think if we get that, we'd be able to secure the funding that we need to pull this idea through. And related to the engineering question, our CTO has created apps before. And while this one is a little bit further on than he, his app was, um, he does have, we all have one third equity of the company and we will be getting other developers come on as well. But right now he is our lead developer and he is, he does have equity in the company and that's all we got for that one. <laughs> so th th this is intended to be a mobile app, right? Yes, a mobile app. And I can't recall if maybe you updated the slides since this printout, but I'm looking at year five and I'm not seeing anybody taking a salary. 
Yeah, that's one of the big assumptions. I mean, we're focusing solely on the business right now. Um, and I agree, like, with something like this, it's going to probably, you know, have to be backed on equity, at least for the beginning, once we get the capital going. Uh, I, I marinated pork and spinach for years, so, I mean, it's like a $5 meal at Walmart. It's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, to make this work, we're going to have to definitely. Um, Thank you. <laughs> well, I just think the only thing that stood out to me is just the kind of um, identity crisis bet between being a profitable business and a not-for-profit. How do you guys, wh what do you think, how do you put, where do you put yourselves? Yeah, well, I definitely, I think that's a great point. You know, we definitely want to leave a positive impact on the world. That's something that, you know, if we're not going to make a, a good impact on the world, we're not going to want to do it. Um, but at the same time, we see this as an area that could be profitable. Um, of course, it would probably be easier, especially if we had like donors, if we made it something for non-for-profit, but we just decided to go the profit route for now. Thank you both. Great job. Now, would you all please welcome, join me in welcoming Michelle Liu and Mia Bella Espialat, co-founders of Catalyst. Good luck, Michelle and Mia Bella, and please start your pitch when you are ready. Hello, I'm Mia Bella Espala. And I'm Michelle Liu. And this is Catalyst, Start Your Future Here. So we're gonna give you this scenario. Imagine you're a student, or when you were a student, and you're looking for internships, and it's been two to three hours. You finally find a couple of internships you like. So when you find these internships, you're reading the specifications, you're reading that this is a really good fit for me. You're going all the way down until you realize the requirements say rising sophomore, you're not a sophomore, you're not a rising sophomore, you're actually a junior. So you just wasted two to three hours of your time looking for an internship when if you had a certain filter, you could have been like this and you would have been directed directly to your internship. So customer issues. We want to put you into the perspective we had first when it came with this idea. So we're going to start off with struggling search. Surprisingly, many companies actually don't put their internship on LinkedIn or other job posting sites like Handshake. So essentially, this huge part is essentially collecting every internship available and being able to put this into our database. Second, specific requirements. This is something we just discussed. So again, imagine you're wasting your time and you're going through hours of internships and you're trying to find the one you want until, again, you don't meet the requirement and you didn't even know this to begin with. An entry-level meaning. We want to bring back the true meaning of entry-level. There's a lot of entry-level jobs now that have minimum experience of five years. I don't know anyone here, but I don't have five years experience as a college student. So we would really like to bring back that meaning and also take away a lot of retail and sales associate whenever you look for entry level and experience search. So a huge part of this is being able to connect to your peers about other internships. So imagine you're trying to find out if an internship is right for you, so you connect with your peers and they're able to have an online forum to share their experience. For these next two slides, we're looking at two different design drafts for our company's website. In this first slide, you are looking at the filtering for marketing internships in gaming companies. Here, you are also able to see ratings, recommendation, and sponsored internships. This, this next slide shows the available and specific filters for our search engine. 
Okay, so solutions. Essentially, let's get into what you just saw. So what you just saw, again, is collecting every internship available between all the companies, collecting a database of companies, and specific and narrowing filters. So experience level difficulty. Sometimes you apply and you don't know how difficult it is. Maybe someone wants to make sure they really do get this internship, so they'll apply to something that's like two stars out of five of difficulty. Or we have industry and field. As you just saw before, there was gaming and marketing. So for marketing or management, you can go to different fields. You can do pharmaceutical, you can do technology, you can do stock, but you can do gaming as well or entertainment. There's not really filters on LinkedIn, Handshake, or Monster, or even Indeed that has it where you can actually do by field and industry unless you really want to know what you're looking for. An application deadline. So when I'm going for my applications, a lot of time these applications aren't put to the top when it's due very soon. So that's something we'd want to do. As well as big business versus small business. As I'm sure most people here went to Seton Hall, a huge reason why people attend Seton Hall is because the small classrooms. That was a huge reason for me attending Seton Hall. So a lot of people might prefer that in their own workplace going on in the future or supporting local businesses by having more internships. And disability friendly and major. So a lot of times, actually, very surprisingly, a lot of internships aren't actually disability friendly. And this is something we really want to look into with the company's history and the specific internship itself, if it's realistic for someone with disabilities. And requirement, as I just gave you that scenario beforehand, uprising sophomores, uprising juniors, and even recent graduates, which is very rare to actually find an internship that has recent graduates as a requirement announcing networking events, and expressing your experience through a forum connected to the company and business so you can really connect to your peers when it comes to an internship and see if this internship is the right fit for you. For our customers and validation, we took a survey of 47 struggling college students and recent graduates. During this survey, participants answered for the best way to reach them and keep their usage towards our site. Nearly unanimously, the participants agreed with liking a site to reach internships faster, as well as the agreement to view an ad prior to the using our search engine. Nearly 97% of participants answered that working with colleges, getting sponsored, and social media would be the best ways to reach them. They also answered that a notification system on their profile favorites, new opportunities, events, an online forum to share their experience would keep them engaged. 98% of the participants answered that they were eager to use a site such as ours. Due to our uniqueness, there is not a specific market that we would be associated with. However, the current job and internship posting sites made around $15.7 billion during 2023. Our target for the market is roughly 18 to 20 million current college students and 19 to 10, 9 to 10 million recent graduates. So, competition, I named off the before, LinkedIn, Handshake, Monster, Indeed. So I'm sure the first time we mentioned internship posting, your mind went to LinkedIn. However, this is where we differ. They aren't focused on internships, and they're also a job posting site. No, one would, no company would be posting onto our site. We're actually collecting the database and the links to actually upload it to essentially this huge database with filters. So no company can go through it and we make sure it's not a scam as well as the fact that, again, these sites don't have specific filters or a huge online forum dedicated to certain internships and they don't help students cut down on their time and direct them to what internship they really want. For profit, we would rely on sponsorships, the required ad view before the use of the search engine on our site, and subscription for resume assistance. For our forecasting is $1,000 to $50,000 from ad revenue, $3,000 to $20,000 from sponsorships, and between $30 and $70 per month on subscriptions. For the cost of operations, we are looking at the website creation, coders, patents, marketing, and people to find internships on every site or company's site, as well as keeping track of dates. This would cost between $20,000 to $50,000, $20,000 being the base minimum for the website creation. And thank you for your time. Judges, do you have any questions?
Thank you very much. Great presentation, great idea. This one hits close to home because I have a daughter graduating college who's been looking for an internship and it's very challenging. But I think the one thing I want to know more about is, you know, I understand the differentiator between like a LinkedIn. It's all about that internship or that first time career jump, um, trying to find that entry level job is the one area that I thought that was the most interesting as far as being a real differentiator is the forum. And just talk to me a little bit about what happens in that forum, how are you gonna make it special, how is it really gonna pay off, like what you guys stand for as an organization? Okay, that's a really interesting question. So my inspiration, and I don't know any other student, whenever I had tried to search up uh, Warner Brother Media Internship Experience, I have to add Reddit to the end of it. So whenever I try to find anything related to internship experiences, it always came from Reddit, and there wasn't many of them there. So we truly wanted to create a forum and a community where you'd be there and you'd be able to see not only the process, because a huge question for people, if you ever search internship, um, internship on Reddit, you'll see a lot of people ask, when am I gonna hear back? What are the qualifications they're really looking for? And it's really hard to find that information unless someone has made a YouTube video about it or you're going on Reddit and there's one person who actually got the job. What we want to do is be able to have a form unified community to bring this to the people where it's easier when you click on a company, you already see the reviews, you'll see almost the interactive forum of how was it during the interview? How is it during this? What did you wear? So you're able to engage with other peers in case of anxiety for these things. That almost reminds me of like Rate My Professor, and I really like how you're yeah. applying that to internships. <laughs> so very cool. So my question is kind of to your notion in the beginning on how long it might take someone to filter through all of the information and then finding out that it's not a good fit. Um, just give me some background as to how you're going to have the postings up yourself. Are you spending hours on your end finding these postings um, only to find whether they're valid or not? Are you um, attending various colleges to then copy their board similar to Seton Hall at the Career Center? Can you walk me through that? Okay, so essentially what our main idea was, we wanted to actually assimilate or collect a long list of companies to actually go through their sites. Because again, truly a lot of companies actually really don't post it since some of them actually really want you to find them first. So this is a huge problem and a huge issue when it comes to posting on LinkedIn is that these companies will have it there. And a lot of other sites like Indeed and Monster I'm very sorry to say, but sometimes it's a lot of, like, it leads you to a scam. And so for this, we want to directly link you to the company site itself. There's nothing, you, have to, you don't have to put your resume through us. You'll go straight to the company. So again, via this, we're going to be able to try our best. We're going to collect a lot of companies. We're going to go through their sites. And we're going to go start by categories, if we can. And if anything, we'll also surf LinkedIn, possibly linked link into our site as a, a link because a lot of people do like to submit their resumes through LinkedIn because it's attached to their profile. So in the opening, I know they mentioned I started a company while I was here and that was actually a job board. Um, and one of the things just to be aware of is you know, when you, what you're talking about is effectively scraping the applicant tracking systems and then bringing that in. Indeed, in those guys, they're pretty much doing that. So the fact that I would just give maybe different thought into the fact that they would not they would not exclude any of those internship roles. The question is more so: Are the companies even posting true internship opportunities on their ATS systems because they're not being scraped into Indeed and those other larger you know job boards? So just just some food for thought, I guess. Just to clarify, that was um, just a comment or a question. Um, more of a, I guess comment, I guess. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> but no, um, no, I like the idea and yeah, good luck. No, 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 no particular question. Okay, thank you. So, uh, real quick, because I'm going to run out of time, but um, do you guys have a CTO or someone, again, on your side? Because to be honest with you, the tech is easy. It doesn't sound like it, but by what yeah. I saw. So, um, we don't really have official, like, CTO. However, we are actually working with a couple coders that we know from Rutgers and a couple of our own friends. Um, we have another couple en engineers that are working with us. Unfortunately, they're not CN Hall students and they don't want to be a part of this presentation today, but they are in the progress of helping us when it comes to this. And we're also trying to go through the like, CN Hall student and see if there is a web designer professor, as my personal professor has been trying to guide me and help me with people who are able to do this for me and able to help me and guide me to the right direction. Yeah, the, the reason what I was getting at is coding this is not hard. The hard part is uh, I'm going to ask you to consider one thing. This is my last question around the revenue. 
drop the ads. It's it's guerrilla. It's a guerrilla marketing. You have alumni in the school who got who have jobs could get get you connected, and use an alumni network from other schools to get the jobs onto here. And then you do a rev share for people who want to do resume writing. You had this in your plan, by the way. You had resume writing. You have people who are trying to sell their services. That's where your revenue share. You do a rev revenue share deal with those people for interns and college students looking for jobs, and then you get the supply in. So, how do you think about that idea? Would you think about pivoting because that would lower your costs, your operating costs? Uh, truly, I would honestly have to think about it because for us, we really thought of the idea of the short. I don't know if you've ever used EasyBib before. If anyone here has used EasyBib, before you use EasyBib, you have to watch an ad, and it's like a 30, 20 second ad. So that's where we got our inspiration from beyond YouTube when it comes to that because we thought it would be a very easy, almost um, consistent way of revenue, which is what we had thought. But we were really trying to lean into sponsorships and specifically before, I hope we don't run out of time, uh, we also wanted to do something similar to Google where if you want to buy almost ad space in a sense to put your internship when you fit these filters up higher onto the page as well. So it's something I will have to look through. For. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> it's okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you for your time. Thank you. Great presentation, you two. All right. Now, would you all please join me in welcoming Sid Kapoor, Jerry Ford, and Cameron Lloyd and their innovative business, DocuForge. Good luck, you all. My name is Jerry Ford. And I'm Cameron Lloyd. And today we're going to be talking about DocuFord. All right. Now, before we get started, what is a PRD? A PRD stands for Product Requirements Document. Suppose Professor Sherrick is a local farmer who wants to sell produce on an app. She's going to have to first create a PRD. This PRD will consist of all the technical requirements that the document will have for a software freelancer to create the app. Think about it as a set of instructions. But unfortunately, how e however easy I made that process sound, it's a lot more complicated, especially for many marginalized people of color, as they have to face language and product development knowledge barriers. This is shown through how people of color, spe specifically Hispanics and African Americans, are underrepresented, for example, in entrepreneurship majors, which kind of causes that lack of product development knowledge. And this is even worse, as unclear technical requirements are the leading cause of project failure at 39%. Now, creating a PRD is also very time consuming and costly. One uh, draft of the PRD takes several hours, sometimes days, to make, never mind the countless iterations that need to occur to maintain proper communication with a software developer. Think about how many ideas we are missing out on. And, and this is where DocuForge could help someone like Professor Sherrick, for example. Um, displayed here is version one of our, of our, of our um, website. So once you're logged in, you can access the home page, account, as well as documents. On this page, you can create your priorities for any desired idea. Here, Prof here Professor Sherrick can create documents for any company. So creating a PRD for, on DocuForge, it's very simple. All you have to do is input your product vision and objectives, target audience and user needs, your key features and functionalities of the product, the type of UI and experience, as well as technical requirements and integrations. After that's filled, the PRD will be generated. So DocuForge takes the technical jargon out of, entrepreneur, out of entrepreneur's hands, allowing time to focus on ideas as well as maintain proper communication with software developers. 
We've sped up formatting issues to ensure a smooth user experience. And creating DocuForge, it was very technical, but we overcame the challenges and obstacles along the way. As far as our market acquisition, there are 1.5 million, million freelance developers globally, and if DocuForge is able to acquire 1% of the market, it will yield $4.5 million, million per year. And DocuForge will tailor it to a global audience, offering customer support in many languages, as well as doing international ad campaigns. So how do we plan on penetrating this market? DocuForge will offer a free two-week trial where entrepreneurs can reach out to freelancers and both will receive two weeks giving freelancers incentive to talk about DocuForge. Entrepreneurs can now save time with lightning fast PRD creations and PRDs can be shared and freelancers can make lightning fast revisions. We plan on offering two plans, the standard plan and the company plan. The first one is $25 a month per person for 50 PRDs per month. The second one is $40 per person per month for 350 PRDs. We not only offer superior price point and speed to our competitors, but we have the additional services of cloud services, automatic wireframe graphics, and automatic version recording. We intend on minimizing costs by introducing new features as time progresses. Version one will have our engine and website. Version two, people will have the ability to share and revise PRDs, plus we'll expand our marketing campaigns. In version three, we'll introduce a job board to capture a greater portion of the market, and in versions four and five, we'll introduce Gen AI capabilities. This is a quote from within the market that we are trying to penetrate. We know that with DocuForge, we can revolutionize not just the PRD game, but entrepreneurship as a whole. Great. Now, judges, you have received a sheet of paper that kind of goes over how you can optimize or add improvements to your website or app uh, through DocuForge. And create, communicating with a software freelancer has become 20 times easier now. Great. And uh, since we have extra time, we are doing ongoing beta testing with two companies. Micromark, I'll start with that one. Uh, professor Chaz Fox, he's a professor here, and uh, his website sells online tools. Uh, for like home decoration, for example. Uh, our website is coming into play for his search engine optimization, so he's cutting time and money to add more improvements to his website. Great, and again, since we have extra time, these are the potential customer uh, segments that we can target, but especially for the financial projections that we have on the business plan, both the conservative and the uh, more aggressive one, we're just focusing on freelance developers for simplicity. Great, and yeah, I think that is it for today. Thank you so much. So really quick, in the end there, you said you're focusing on the freelancer. So, but is this, isn't this a tool that a company, like you'd sell into a, an organization, like a startup company or so the internal person would have a tool that then helps them onboard with an external freelancer. So why are you marketing first to the external freelancer? That's what I was a little confused about. Sure. Um, regardless of the systems that are currently in place, like Upwork and Arc, yeah. uh, let's say I'm uh, someone who wants to create an app. If I go to talk to a software freelancer, I don't have any technical knowledge on my end. I'm still going to run into problems trying to communicate ideas with him. Right or her, and um, right, and so with that being said, DocuForge comes in handy when I can skip that technical jargon and just be able to focus on my business. Okay, it's so it's it's just providing a brief and a framework for the project that a freelancer then would give to me as someone I'm hiring on Upwork, say. Correct, as okay. well as future revisions, which are a key process to PRD creations, um, and uh, yeah, and okay. proper communication. Okay. I love demos <laughs> when you're making your presentations. So you actually uh, walk through the uh, creating a prototype of sorts. Um, the the main concern I have, so I, I definitely see a market for this. I used to build mobile apps. I, I, I know about the requirement documents. Have you guys thought about creating mini use cases to help market this? Like I know you said freelancers, but it'd be good to say, like you just said here, 
here's a mobile app for, I don't know, uh, gardening tips or something, or, and how you go about it, and, and another, and, and if you were to create that. So that's one question for you. The second one, though, is a tough one. I didn't see much on the competition. And I saw that there were some things around ChatGPT here. There are others who could do this. How do you protect yourselves? So, because th everyone's going to be in this business. How do you protect yourselves and grow at the same time when you have the likes of Microsoft and others who can do it in your stead? I'm so happy you asked those questions. So the customer segment was up there, and that's uh, one of the customer segments that's there. For example, schools. We will have representatives in schools talking to students about how they could use DocuForge. So that answers your first question. And then the second question is, what makes us so special? Why, is this, why can this not be replicated? We have a few trade secrets in our software. Uh, we worked with Peter, too, who is also at this university to kind of uh, hammer in what our advantage is. Second, um, yeah, you might have seen there's build, build My PRD free or something like that uh, website, but they don't have graphics. Our website has graphics, and software freelancers stress the importance of having a UI or something to look at of what the app would look like. And that's something that we took our time to build and uh, put in. That's way more easier to use than ChatGPT. If you try making a picture out of ChatGPT, it's pretty bad, right? Um, Furthermore, it's our sales team as well. We have, again, as our go-to market approach, um, we have cold callers specifically targeting software freelancers. So having that sales team set up and built kind of sets us at a huge advantage compared to other ChatGPT apps. I would just like to comment. I really like your logo, and it's a well-thought-out name. So you should know that. That's very Thank catchy. It's, it's good. Um, this is not my rigmarole frame of understanding, so excuse any of my lack of jargon here. But I'm interested because you touched on in your proposal the introduction of a job board feature, which you even showed an example of. And um, so just that I can confirm my understanding of it, would you almost act like Fiverr or Fiverr, however you pronounce it, and the only difference being that you have the background information to then create the document to then pursue that um, relationship? Correct, yeah. And we plan to introduce that year uh, two or three, right? Uh, for, yeah, three. Um, and the reason for that is we will already have clients, people that are using the software, that are software freelancers. They're already going to be on the app. All we have to do is give them credentials, have them upload a resume to their profile that they have, and boom, the job board is already constructed. Okay, so for example, if I wanted to move ahead with the wonderful proposal you handed me, I could then just go to your website, find the individuals that would be able able and capable of moving forward with any of these items, and then transacting that document right then and there? Yep, spot on. Cool, thank you. Thank you. I like this. Thank you so much, thank you. Thank you, Sid, Jerry, and Cameron. You guys did a great job. Now it's time for our la last finalists, MBA students Taylor, Madeline, and Walker, and their business, Refresh Me. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having us tonight. My name is Taylor Patnode, and I'm joined by my team, Madeline Matheny, Walker Perra. Okay, so picture this. You're a stay-at-home parent who spent the last 5, 10, 15 years being the primary caretaker in your home. Now that your kids are all back in school, you've decided you want to go back to work. But once you start this process, you realize it's a lot more difficult than you originally thought. Here at Refresh Me, our goal is to streamline the process between being a stay-at-home parent and a working parent. So now we're going to go over some of the problems that this target market face. The first problem being that this is a difficult transition. This has been a difficult transition for decades, but more recently, Indeed published a study in August of 2023 that over 90% of stay-at-home parents face major difficulties when going through this process. The next is a lack of community. Whether you've been out of the workforce for a year or five years, 
It can be difficult to reach out to past coworkers and, or employers who have moved on, and this can be a really lonely process. And lastly, lack of current technology or technology skills. This, so as we've seen in today's market, things like artificial intelligence are now being used in businesses. And this can be very daunting for somebody who's been out of the workforce trying to understand this technology. And now I'm going to pass it on to Madeline, who's going to explain our solutions to these problems. Hi, I'm Madeline. I have a background in supply chain. And the first thing that Refresh Me aims to address is the current skills gap from stay-at-home parents as they're entering the workforce. So how we're going to tackle this is mainly through our course packs. We have three different ones. The first is the basic. Then you have our recommended and the premium. Walker's going to go more into detail about that in his later slides. Uh, so we have a tailored curriculum where each member is going to have to pass a series of modules. Uh, through that, they have final exams. And what sets us apart is also our exit interviews that every member is going to have to uh, go through in order to get a final certification. And the certification they can present to their future employers. RefreshMe is great because we offer a virtual platform. That way, our uh, members can access it anytime, anywhere, because we know how important your time is as a parent. With community uh, and engagement, we think this is very important in our culture here at RefreshMe. Uh, we're going to do this through having workshop nights, resume building, kind of just fostering that whole community segment. We think that'll be extremely important because sometimes the process can seem like you're alone. It's really hard as a stay-at-home parent trying to get back into the workforce. All of our moms went through it themselves, and they said they really wish that they had someone that was going through the same thing to talk to. Lastly, with partnerships and placements, we're going to try to reach out to different businesses, see if they align with our mission and our goals, and then we're also going uh, to partner with other colleges, university, any professors that are going to want to join our team. For placements, we're going to have our own recruiter on our website. That way they can meet with every member and they can learn their unique skill sets and pair them with the perfect job. So what makes us better than recruiters, LinkedIn, college courses, and returnships? First, with recruiters, we offer a way more personalized experience, and we also offer that learning uh, courses, trying to fill that skills gap, whereas a recruiter is just going to try and take your money and then maybe get you a job. Compared to LinkedIn, we have a more hands-on experience, and our certification will seem more accomplished because with LinkedIn, you just kind of pass these series of quizzes, and then you get a certification. But with us, you'll have your modules that you can complete on a percentage basis, and then you also have to go through our final exams and our exit interviews. Compared to college courses, we offer a more condensed workload and way less expensive than the average credit hour. Compared to returnships, we offer a virtual platform and personal support. Sometimes when you go to these returnships, you don't know if they're even going to offer you a job, and you could spend months and months looking on, under someone, and it doesn't even matter. So now I'm going to pass it on to Walker. So RefreshMe has five sources of revenue, three of them being the different packages that Madeline had mentioned. The base package has two courses uh, with access for over four months. Um, it's mainly just to target people that want to touch up on a few things before going back to work. Um, but the recommended package is what provides everything that we think is necessary before going back to work. So this includes five courses to eight, with eight months of access, and then access to all the major features, which is the open office hours, the network, events, workshops, um, a letter of recommendations, and meeting with the recruiters. The premium package offers unlimited access to course material with no expiration. They also are provided priority recruitment and advanced certifications and it's really for people that want a little more, uh, I don't know, I guess, hand-walking to their job, right? And the other two sources of income are the annual membership and additional meetings. So the financials are based on a survey we conducted with over 200 people. Uh, it's also once we'd be fully operational. Uh, the first year, we expect a small loss because of a major investment in software and marketing. Uh, the years two and three, we expect major revenue and revenue growth and margin expansion. This is because we believe it's a sticky model, right? So if we show in the first year that this, is, this will have proven track record of having high placement percentages, then people will want to join, right? And they'll see it, they'll hear from others, and 
learn about this network that we're providing and the success that it gives. And also we have a, a pretty large consumer group. Just in February there were six million unemployed Americans and 38% of those were people trying to re-enter or enter the workforce, right? Um, so, and most of our expenses are from salaries and wages. This is broken into instructors and support staff. Uh, we plan to take on a similar model as Peloton, where you can have a limited amount of instructors with a large customer base, right? So go back and watch the videos, even if you're not watching in the real time, but there's still that engagement and people have like a personality behind that person, right? And our, I, even as we grow, our mission is to refresh skills, instill confidence, and provide a community for our valued members. Thank you, and this is Refresh Me, where skills shine and jobs align. <laughs> Great presentation. So did you guys, do you have any data as to how long the average person seeking to re-enter the job market is, is actually looking for a job compared to somebody who's already in the job force? You're, you're asking how long they were out or how long they're... So, so you had the six million people who are actively, I, I took that statistic as six, six million individuals are looking to re-enter the, the, the job force, the workforce, um, which put about 2.4 million were, I'm oh, sorry, there's 6 million unemployed, 2.4 million were looking to re-enter the workforce. Do you have any data as to how long that 2.4 million people are looking for a job compared to the other, what was that, 3.6 million? So I'll, I'll go over our, our survey results. I, I guess I'm, just to maybe further clarify, I'm trying to understand to what level, to what degree of disadvantage are the people who are not in the current workforce like what are they, what's their uphill battle really looking like? So I don't have specific numbers for you. I'm not sure if my teammates do, but one thing in our surveys, talking to people face to face who've gone through this, I think the biggest challenge sometimes was the timeline, but also taking jobs they're way overqualified for because they've had this 10 year age, this 10 year work gap. And they're like, well, I start, I was a manager 10 years ago, but now it's been 10 years. So I'll just take this job making $30,000 less. So I think we do need to follow up on those numbers, but I think a bigger issue for the people we discuss sometimes was the timeline, um, but a lot of the time was taking a job for way less salary than they would have years prior. Yeah, and ha having the flexible model where you, you either can attend the classes or do it at your own time, I think it's something where they can kind of start to plan that like they're not all right, I need to get a job immediately. It's like, immediately, it's like, all right, my kid's about to leave, go to college, I'm gonna be an empty nester. Like, I'll start trying to prepare myself and freshen up on those skills. Um, I'm just curious, do you have a, 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 a typical type of um, person who's looking to get back in the workforce, like a tech engineer versus someone in nursing? Like, I, I don't know, so can, can you give me one and then I have a follow-up to that answer? your answer, I mean, because you can't do all, there's different trainings for all of them, right? So yeah. who do you think you're starting with? So it was a lot of moms, right, that their, their kids are you now out of the house and maybe they want to be able to set themselves up to live a more luxurious lifestyle once they retire, right? So uh, a lot of that was either like administrative work or HR, um, so some of the like modules we were thinking is either like HR software, uh, uh, using LinkedIn and Excel, stuff like cool. that. Cool, and then the follow-up is, do you have a sample of what that is? Because that's the product, right? Mm -hmm. So do you guys have a sample, or you're still working on that? Yeah, so we, we've discussed it, and I think before we, we did that, we wanted to do a lot more surveying and get did, get as much survey and data as we could before investing in those uh, all the time and making modules, right? But I think with our team now, I mean, I have a background in finance and IT management, and then she's marketing and she's supply chain. So we have a background just between the three of us to kind of get a start on those models. And even through other friends, we may have people interested in helping us out set those up. So nice job, really nice job. I think um, I have a little bit of experience in this because one of my clients is an online um, college university. And post COVID, the a number of online options for getting people back to school and finishing what they started is reached at unprecedented level. So what I like about your concept is sort of that you're helping people 
get credit for what they've already done and they don't even know how much credit they already have, whether it's toward a degree or toward a specific job. Um, do you have any plans to partner with online universities um, or have you identified that as sort of like an opportunity that you guys can explore? Yeah, so, so for the instructors, the key thing we're gonna look at is, is professors. Um, that was one of the partnerships we were gonna make and then through that, I mean, they, they can build on their network and uh, potentially we could structure something where the, the more followers they have or uh, they can earn more, right? So uh, professors, I mean, they have a few classes a week um, and it's the same structure here. So they'd be able to do two to three classes a week uh, in the models and the expenses. We projected them to be doing about two to three hours a week and if they want to take additional meetings, they could. Um, but it, it really allows a flexible workspace there. So, yeah. Great presentation. I do think that there is a great need for it. I have my mom in the audience who I think would find this very helpful. So that's awesome that you, you saw this, and I appreciate that you even saw that within your own parents to then come up with this idea. Um, so my question is specifically, I'm interested to understand the courses more. You touched on LinkedIn Learning, and for example, LinkedIn breaks down their modules very well as to a certain course has, for example, four modules of which each has five videos. And so when you say the base model has two courses, what does that entail? Is that seven videos? Is it two modules with eight hours worth of information? Can you break that down for me? Yeah, so you, you got yeah, it. Okay. I think you were talking yeah, about Yeah, absolutely. So we've been discussing the model, and again, we really want to meet with someone who can help us build this and bring this to reality. But what we were thinking is, realistically, a stay-at-home parent, I babysit, by no means can do the work that they do, but you know, sometimes they're only going to have when their kid is taking a nap, maybe an hour before they bring their kid to soccer practice. So we were thinking of doing... 15 minute segments and a five minute quiz and breaking it down into as depending on how much data they need to go through and how much they need to learn depending on what we decide is beneficial for them making sure it's bite-sized pieces and then following that there's going to be a test in our exit interview which I think is huge to our business where we're like really getting to see firsthand they understand that it's not just on their resume and I think that's really that's really something we bring to the table. I appreciate that. To follow up, would there... Okay, no problem, great job. Thank, Thank you. you guys so much. All right, so how's, how's everyone doing? Uh, the judges right now are gonna do the deliberations on the awards, um, but in the meantime, now is the time for the Audience Choice Awards. So if all you guys can get your phones out, um, you can vote for whoever you thought was pitch perfect, whoever gave the best pitch. Um, you should be able to scan that QR code. It will lead you to a Google Doc, um, and we'll give you all a few minutes to fill that out.
All right, so the voting for the Audience Choice Award has concluded. Now we'll take a 20-minute break. We invite you all to join the lobby for dinner refreshments while we wait the return of the judges to see what they've decided. There you go. That's what you're doing. That's good. I'm just going to leave this up here.
All right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, hopefully, you guys got to stretch your legs for a little bit, have some food. Uh, I don't know if they were prepared for the number of or for the number of people that were here, uh, since I think a class uh, showed up or a full class showed up. Um, but it was good; there was enough food for everyone. Um, so, of course, welcome back, judges. Uh, the first part is I will welcome Shannon Morris to the podium. Uh, up next, I will uh, introduce Dean Joy Strasser for the awards. And then the closing uh, remarks will be with Professor Susan Chair. Okay, so just um, real quick, just to uh, speak for the judges. Everybody made our jobs very, very difficult this year. I would, I've done this several times. I don't know how many times, but I would say this year is probably the most difficult in terms of deciding that first, second, and third place winner. So our task was to judge based on your business plan, your pitch, and then your ability to answer our tough questions. And so that's where we started. But then we also looked at really the feasibility and the viability of your concepts and challenged ourselves to see what you presented in terms of what's called an MVP, so your minimal viable product. So how it actually can come to life. Um, and we also tried to really just go beyond the fact that some, some people just have really great ideas that have a really great spark behind them and how much we could really visualize ourselves in that idea, even though you didn't have an MVP presented. I would say that we ended up with three really great um, winners. Um, it was very, very close. And I think in the end, it's gonna come down to just your ability to continue to ask questions, to challenge yourself, and to also continue to refine your ideas. Um, I think there were so many great concepts. There was not a really a bad idea here tonight. So just continue to challenge yourselves. And like I said, continue to refine them, focus them a little bit more, and keep at it. You know, that's what the spirit of entrepreneurialism is. So, um, also, make sure you get all of our contact information. A couple of you have come up and asked some really great questions for some feedback. But just get our contact information because we all really want to help you bring these ideas to life and take it to the next level. So that's, that's it. Again, thank you, judges, for taking the time, uh, especially at heard um, this year was very competitive, uh, maybe compared to past years, so thank you for taking that time to select. And now we we'll welcome Dean Joyce Strasser to the stage to announce our winners of the three, uh, I guess, original awards and then the also audience choice that you guys voted for yourselves. So welcome Dean Strasser to the stage. Okay, this is the exciting moment. Proud of all of you, I just want to say that. But let's start off with the Audience Choice Award. And our Audience Choice Award winners are DocuForge. So that's, come on up and get your check. All right, then our third place winners are Catalyst. So we've got Michelle Liu and Mirabella Escalat.
And second place goes to Docky Forge. <laughs> And our first prize winner is Attendee VPN, so Nathaniel Beckham. Thanks everyone who helped out um, and for this contest. Thank you to the Dean for being here, for our judges, for all of you who have incredible ideas, your incredible students. I feel so honored to work with you. Now we'd like everyone, all of the contestants to come up please and, um, and for photos. We'd love a group photo, we'd love the judges to be in it, and we'd love to take pictures of the team. So thank you very much and remember, this is the beginning of your entrepreneurial journey, not the end. Echo, uh, Echo Phil is going up to um, Boston um, for another contest. Um, we have a lot of contests going on, and so um, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>